Good afternoon. I'm Hal Kremel, a uh, faculty member here in the English department and uh, the founding co-chair of the university's Environmental Issues Committee. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alan Matheson today, um, who's the state planning coordinator, but he's also otherwise known as the governor's environmental advisor. Uh, Alan has been the senior environmental advisor to Governor Gary Herbert since October 2011 and state planning coordinator since September 2013. In these roles, he oversees a major statewide growth planning initiative, coordinates planning efforts among state agencies, and works closely with stakeholders throughout Utah to develop sound natural resource and environmental policy and implement environmental initiatives. Alan previously served as executive director of Envision Utah, where he oversaw numerous regional initiatives to help communities address growth challenges in ways consistent with their values. He's consulted with dozens of regions around the country and has published articles on water, transportation, and land use. He has additional experience as a partner in the Phoenix law firm, as senior attorney and environmental policy advisor for Arizona's largest electric utility, and as the founding director of the Utah Water Project. In the community, Alan serves on several boards and committees, including the Envision Utah Board of Trustees, the Utah Clean Air Partnership, and the Sandy City Planning Commission. Alan received his AB in International Relations from Stanford University and graduated from the UCLA School of Law, where he was editor and an editor of the UCLA Law Review. And he was a finalist for the 2010 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Please welcome Alan Matheson. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thanks very much for being here for your attention. I have to uh, make a confession to begin with. I'm a little distracted today. And uh, this morning, my oldest son is in the middle of a series of job interviews trying to start his career off and find, you know, kind of that first step toward getting a good job. And my, my daughter had some surgery this morning, so I've been worried about her health and how she's doing and making sure that she can get home safely. And then in uh, about an hour and a half, my, my youngest son has the tip-off in a high school basketball playoff game that I'm going to try to get to. And so I'm, I'm thinking about these things, my daughter's health, my son's opportunities for jobs, the quality of life we have, the opportunity for my kids to be able to express themselves and fulfill their, their hopes, and things like a hectic legislative session and the other things that kind of carry on day to day in life just don't mean so much to me today. And you know, I think that's kind of true with all of us. We're driven by our values, driven by those things that matter most to us down deep. And it was mentioned that uh, in my previous job, I worked with Envision Utah. One of the things that organization did was do a very sophisticated evaluation of the values of the people that live in Utah. What do they care about most? What drives our decision making? And we found some really interesting things. But I was, I was talking uh, to a guy at one point who was involved in this process. He was the former president of Geneva Steel, and you know, Dan in Provo. And he had come on board and decided he was going to clean up the air in Utah County. And he spent hundreds of millions of dollars and most of his time putting controls on Geneva Steel and reducing the emissions there. And he was talking once to Richard Worthlin. Richard Worthlin is kind of the, the founder of this values research process. He uh, was counselor to presidents and national parties and Fortune 500 companies. And the president of Geneva Steel said, Richard, I've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. I've gone out of my way to reduce emissions from this facility. And people are still angry. What's going on? And Worthlin said, what you need to understand is that air quality touches more values than pretty much any other issue. And no matter what you try to do, you're not going to do enough because you think about what it means. It's those things I mentioned before. My health, my feeling of, of security, 
the love I have for family and wanting to make sure that they're healthy, you know, the opportunities for jobs, for economic expansion, the beauty that surrounds us. Air quality interferes with the beauty of these mountains, uh, with our ability to get outside, to be active, all those things that matter and touch us deeply. So it's a, it's a critical issue, and I'm glad we get a chance to, to visit uh, a little bit about it today. Let me uh, go through this. So most of you probably know that on average, in an average year, we meet the federal air quality standards 95% of the time. And in fact, I was looking at this list the other day of the, it had the top 30 polluting cities in the country on an annual average. And there wasn't a Utah community listed in the top 30 on an annual average. So, good news, right? We've done all we need to do. We're okay. Absolutely not. I think we can all agree that we are not where we need to be and that we do have this ongoing problem during inversions in the winter, during st stagnant air periods in the summer, usually in July when we've got ozone problems. These are real issues. And during those periods of time, the emissions that build up in our atmosphere can be significant and harmful. I think we also recognize that when we talk about those federal standards, those are based on research, but we also know that there isn't a safe level of pollution in the atmosphere, that anything can cause harm. And so it ought to be our goal to eliminate days that exceed the standards and continue down from there. And that, in fact, is the goal. And those are things that we're working on. All right. so. Uh, Let's talk just briefly about inversions and what happens. I think most of you are familiar. We get these uh, experiences during the winter when a high pressure system comes in and puts a cap over our valleys. And everything that's emitted during those inversions is captured within our air shed and doesn't escape. Now, we get two kinds, two general kinds of pollutants during these inversions. One is direct emissions of small particulates. And those are things that come out of the tailpipe or the, the stove or whatever it is as particulates. And remarkably, that's a small minority of the pollutant we see. Seventy percent of the particulate pollution that we get is as a result of chemical reactions in this soup. You know, we get these gases that get in the atmosphere and the inversions actually produce small particulates. Seventy percent of what we have are from these chemical reactions. So a lot of what we have to do is understand these reactions and how we uh, insert ourselves into those reactions to stop them and stop the development of uh, the, the small particulates. Okay, when we talk about the wintertime problems, we are talking about PM 2.5 or particulates that are two and a half micro, micrometers or less in size fraction of the size of the human hair. Particularly dangerous because when they're inhaled, they get deep into the lungs, can go straight into the bloodstream, and get through all the organ systems of the body. Something that uh, you know, is a concern for all of us. Now, I mentioned a little bit before about uh, the chemistry and these emissions. This is a chart here that gives us a sense for what is emitted during an inversion. As I said, down here, this is direct emissions of small particulates, about 5% of the, the overall emissions. The rest of these nitrous oxides, hydrocarbons, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, etc., that react in the atmosphere and create small particulates. And this also gives an indication of the sources of those various pollutants. So commercial and residential or area sources are the blue, transportation is the red, uh, the yellow is our large industry point sources. These are the categories that EPA has identified. I think I'll just kind of skip over that. So we know that uh, during an inversion, the emissions build. And once that inversion starts, we tend to see almost a doubling of the pollution each day of the inversion. So it, it tends to accelerate as you get farther into it. 
Another challenge that we face and will continue to face is the fact that we've got changing standards at the federal level. As you can see here, in the 1970s, the standard for particulate matter was 260 units of total suspended particulates. Then in the early 80s, that went down to uh, about 150, but now we're measuring particulate matter of 10 microns or smaller. Then it goes, in 1996, down to PM 2.5 at 65 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. And then in 2006, that standard went down again to 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So as we get more information, as EPA gets more information, about the health impacts of these pollutants, we're finding impacts at lower and lower levels. And as a result, the standard goes down. And each time the standard goes down, the requirements that kick in also become, uh, you know, ratcheted down, more stringent. So, let me see here. There we go. So just to give you a sense of where things have been, when we were talking total suspended particulates in the 70s, we were at times over 3,000 micrograms per cubic meter when the standard was 260. In the 80s, 487 micrograms per cubic meter of total suspended particulates. In the 90s, down to 267. 2001, we were about 65. And, uh, and now, when we get those peaks this last year, our peak numbers were kind of in the high 60s. So we're coming down, not where we need to be. Now, one of the things that you know, people say is, all right, well, we get an inversion nothing we can do, and we just have to pray for the next storm to come by. And I don't think that's very healthy, uh, literally and figuratively. So we see a time when the storm ends, and the period between when the storm ends and when the next storm begins, we start building up pollutants. And of course they clear out when the next storm comes through, and when that storm's done, we start building up again. If we can reduce the amount of pollutants emitted during that inversion and slow the rate of the growth of those pollutants within the inversion, we can make a significant difference. It makes a big difference for the health of people and for our quality of life and all the things that we know about. So there's a lot to be said for taking action, not just when we see things are bad, but before they start building up. All right, let me just talk a little bit about air quality trends, where, we're, where, we're, where we've been, where we're going, where we're heading. Okay, research this last year showed that between 1999 and 2012, we've had a, a decrease of between about 30 and 50 percent in terms of exceedances in counties along the Wasatch Front. Okay, good news. Um, if you look at total emissions, this is Salt Lake, Davis, Weber, and Utah counties. Uh, 2002, we were emitting just under 500 tons a day. By 2008, it was just under 400 tons a day, and that continues to go down. In Salt Lake County, again, looking between 2002 and 2011, total emissions from all sources, industry, cars, homes, buildings, restaurants, etc., went from 409,000 tons to 217,000 tons. We're cutting down our emissions. Are we there? No, of course not. But what this tells me is there's hope. We've got a record of being able to make progress despite growing population, despite the vehicle miles traveled increasing fourfold since some of these early numbers were out there. And we're still making progress. That gives me hope. All right, I think the most important question really is, well, what are we doing to continue that trend? We're facing some pretty significant headwinds when you think about the growth in our community. Utah, I think at last count, was second fastest growing state in the country. Uh, that's likely to continue. We've got a young population. We've got the highest birth rate in the nation. We've got one of the best economies in the nation driving people here good economy, uh, good quality of life. All of these things will continue that growth. Uh, 
regardless of what we do about it, unless we just let the uh, air quality get so bad no one wants to be here. But we've got to continue to act to keep the progress going. Let me give you a little sense of some of the things that are happening. Under the Clean Air Act, you're probably aware, um, communities that fail to meet the standards are designated as non-attainment for the air quality standards. And that triggers a series of actions. We're in this series of actions now. We had a state implementation plan due the end of 2012 that didn't get done until 2013, but it's in and it's being implemented right now. Most of those uh, efforts began at the beginning of this year. We then need to show during this attainment window between now and 2019 that we meet all of the federal standards for PM 2.5. So how do we do that? We'll just go through some of the things in the plan. You know, EPA identifies three categories of sources. They're uh, mobile sources, area sources, and point sources, or industries. And each of those areas has different strategies that apply, just because of the nature of them. So we're trying to deal with each of these individually. First of all, uh, our cars and trucks, because of new standards, new fuels, et cetera, the progress has been good. And I think most of the progress we've seen in recent years has been because of a move to the tier two fuel and car standards. Uh, and with the turnover of the fleet, and with the transportation plans that are in place, you know, the increase in transit that we've made, uh, Utah has had the most aggressive expansion of transit in the country over the last decade. Uh, we're going to see our automobile and our vehicle emissions drop almost in half. In fact, maybe more than half in the next five years. It's encouraging. Point sources, industries. The new requirements under the state implementation plan are that all major industrial sources need to install what's called the best available control technology. This is beyond the standards required by the Clean Air Act for an area like ours. We've said we've got to take an additional step. So all industries are going to have to put on these more stringent controls. And that's going to result in a 2,000 ton per year reduction in refiners and about a 4,600 ton per year reduction from all industries. Then you've got the area sources. Area sources are our homes, our buildings, print shops, paint shops, uh, the Burger King that has the charcoal broiled burgers, restaurants, all those things in our community that we rely on every day that create emissions. In some ways, this is uh, the toughest area to regulate. The Division of Air Quality, through the Air Quality Board, passed 23 new regulations that took effect on January 1st of this year. Those 23 new regulations are going to regulate businesses that have never been regulated in the past and continue to crank down. If we're going to solve this problem, it has to be every sector contributing to where we're trying to go. Let me just give you a little sense. Um, I think, at least in my mind, it's a good principle of public policy that we ought to be getting the biggest bang for the buck, or the biggest emission reduction per dollar spent in society. We've got limited money, lots of demands for education, for health care, for infrastructure, on and on and on. When we looked at the rules for these area sources, we were looking at strategies that cost about $6,000 per ton reduced. When we looked at industry, it was higher than that. It got up to more like $25,000 per ton reduced. So we're looking at those strategies that are kind of in the $10,000 or less per ton uh, level. Okay, this is the projection. Once these things are implemented, and over the next five years, where will we be? And uh, what we're looking at is that by 2019, a reduction of about 100 tons per day of emissions. Again, pretty significant. Every day of the year. And uh, most of that coming from vehicles. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Here's where we're projecting. Um, vehicle emissions from 2008 going down to our 
time of uh, attainment compliance demonstration of 2019. You can see pretty good decline, and then it starts leveling off a little bit after that. It's because we're going to have more and more cars on the road. So even though the technology is better, we get more and more cars. Well, the good news is, if uh, you were paying attention this week, EPA passed a new rule called the Tier 3 rules. These are new standards for automobiles and fuel that um, are projected to reduce emissions up to 80% from the Tier 2 vehicles, which aren't even fully implemented yet. So we think with those new rules in place, we can see that trend continue to go down. And I'm going to talk in a minute, though, about why that might not be great news for Utah. Okay, so what are some other things that the state's doing? Certainly you've got the regulatory piece that I've talked about. But beyond that, the state needs to lead by example. There are other things that we can and, and should be doing. Now, the governor is pushing through right now a budget that includes $18 million for air quality, an unprecedented amount. That includes about $14 million for a conversion of old diesel buses to cleaner buses. The primary beneficiaries of that are the school kids that ride them every day. But it's also the people in the neighborhoods. And uh, there's a, a bill, HB 71, I'm sorry, HB 41, that would uh, put $20 million into replacing buses and I think about 170, set up the infrastructure for fueling these buses and set in place what we need going forward to continue that trend. Um, Department of Workforce Services has committed $1.3 million toward grants to go through UCARE. And Ted may have uh, talked about that a little bit in his uh, previous remarks. But this, we think, is something really important. You know, de the Department of Workforce Services is worried about keeping people employed, keeping jobs. And so this money is to go to those small businesses that in order to meet the, the air quality standards, may have to cut back in other ways. If we can subsidize that a little bit, provide some money to help them implement those air emission controls, and keep the jobs in place, there's a win-win there. The governor has issued executive orders requiring all state agencies to have plans to reduce driving and commuting, an anti-idling uh, ordinance uh, or decree. I mentioned the Tier 3 standards, and the governor supported those last year, wrote to EPA and said, we can benefit more than any place in the country. Let's get those standards going. Um, we're replacing our fleet with alternative fuel vehicles. In fact, the, the legislature has passed uh, a bill already that requires that by 2018, half of the state fleet has to be uh, CNG, electric, um, or other alternative fuel cleaner vehicles heading in that direction. The state uh, has just wrapped up an energy efficiency plan. This is a plan looking at industry, agriculture, homes, transportation, all aspects of our society, and implementing strategies to reduce our energy use, which of course has an impact on our air emissions. We've uh, provided free UTA passes for all state employees in the UTA territory and are monitoring that usage, encouraging our folks to take transit. I think uh, in two weeks we're having a, a take transit to work campaign at the state level, encouraging all state employees to take transit and, and some more things. Now I don't know how many of you heard the governor's state of the state announcement, but he said that air quality was one of his priorities. It's key to what we're doing. And he mentioned three things. He mentioned the bus piece and part of his budget, but two new things that uh, hadn't really been discussed a lot before. And the first one was this acceleration to the Tier 3 fuels and vehicles. There's a map that EPA has put out showing county by county around the country the relative reduction in emissions as a result of Tier 3. Right in the middle of the map in northern Utah is this purple spot. Because the seven counties that benefit more than any other in the country from Tier 3 are in Utah. 
The challenge is, under the rule that came out on Monday, there are provisions that allow small refineries to delay implementation of the fuel standards, about three years. And there are also averaging banking and uh, trading provisions that allow the refineries nationally to average among their refiner fleet. So because Utah has small refineries, market principles would suggest that the reductions are going to be made at the big refineries elsewhere and probably not here, at least for some of our refineries. So that's the challenge that we're facing. And when Governor Herbert called for bringing those fuels into Utah sooner, that's what we had in mind. So he's already met with Gina McCarthy, the administrator of EPA, and talked to her about this. We've got a meeting set up next week with the head of the fuels uh, division at EPA to work through these issues. We're meeting with the refineries, asking for their help. We're working with the legislature and their help. There's a resolution before the legislature now uh, calling for the transition to these new fuels. And if we can do that, um, again, we can see some significant benefits, more than anything else that we can do, frankly. So that's a high priority. The other thing that the governor mentioned in his state of the state was wood burning. And there's been some good research that's come out of the University of Utah that uh, helps us understand that wood burning is a bigger part of our winter problem than we had recognized before. And beyond that, the smoke from wood burning is more noxious than maybe we realized in the past. Uh, lots of chemicals, lots of things that are particularly harmful. So the governor called for us to limit the wood burning in non-attainment areas during the entire inversion season. And that's got people mad. And I'll just tell you, legislators are telling us that they've been flooded with calls from people saying, don't take away my wood burning. But the governor's pretty resolute on this. We can have reasonable accommodations. We can raise money, and there's a bill in the legislature to do this, to help those who depend on wood for heating to convert to natural gas. There's an education piece to help people understand that those most impacted by wood burning are the people within the home that's burning the wood. That's where the highest concentration of these noxious pollutants are. Help us understand what it does to your neighbors, et cetera. And you know, the analogy that we've heard is that there were a lot of people in this community who grew up, and it was kind of a common practice in the fall. You'd go out in the backyard and rake up your leaves, set fire to them, and, and watch them burn. You don't see that anymore. Can you imagine what this valley would be like if everybody burned their leaves? Every, every autumn. Things change. Our understanding changes. Our needs change. The amount of people in our limited community changes. So we need to, we need to change along with it if we're going to maintain health and a balance in our community. So that's, a, that's an issue that's difficult, but one that uh, we're working on seriously. I don't know if you're aware of this Utah Air app. You ought to get online this, uh, and pull down Utah Air, and it's something that allows everybody to see what our air quality conditions are in real time, see what restrictions are in place, uh, and kind of get a sense for any advisories that are out there. So this is real time now. Weber County, we're at 1.8 micrograms per cubic meter. It's at parts per billion, so well below the standard of, of 35. So it's a good day. We like to see that. There were some days this winter I pulled this up, saw that nasty red box, and uh, wasn't happy with the results. But this is a way that we can personalize what the air quality means to us and how we're going to decide how to use our time. Partnerships. I know Ted talked about this before. This is a, a pervasive issue, one that requires action on a number of levels. And it doesn't happen just through government. It has to happen through partnerships. And UCARE is a great example. This is bringing people together to find common ground. And there are groups like the Chamber working on the, the uh, Clear the Air Challenge, getting different businesses to, to uh, compete to reduce their emissions, to take transit, et cetera. Got the Wasatch Front Regional Council working on transportation plans. 
You talk clean cities, working on anti-idling things. Breathe Utah, working on this wood burning issue. And on and on and on. Groups that are not just complaining, but are out actually reducing emissions in the air and making a difference. The big issue is how we grow as a community. You know, this sprawl pattern that we've seen in a lot of communities like Phoenix and Los Angeles and others is a problem. As we move farther and farther away on big lots, we not only have to spend more money for infrastructure, but we're spending more time driving. And that's why for the last several years, vehicle miles traveled has almost doubled the population growth because we're driving more. Well, that's changed in the last few years. We're actually getting back down. But the, the Wasatch Choice for 2040, a uh, partnership of a number of organizations and agencies in our community, has developed a plan for, the Weber, Bay, for Weber, Davis, Salt Lake, and Utah counties to develop incentives, put workforce close to the jobs, connect centers with transit. This is a big deal. It's got national attention. And as we develop differently, we're seeing uh, real benefits for air quality. Your Utah, your future. The governor kicked this off at the end of October. This is uh, the largest growth planning effort ever undertaken in the United States of America. It's a statewide effort. We want to involve over 30,000 people. We've got eight task forces working on land use, how we grow, energy issues, water, air quality, education, economic development, housing, key issues, and looking at how they overlap, looking at the feedback loops. So if we want to deal with air quality, we have to understand how our transportation affects that, how our housing choices affect that, et cetera. I won't go into a lot of detail on UCARE because I know Ted covered that before. This was an, an initiative of the governor recognizing that government has a role but can't do everything. It's not in a position to go out and raise money from the pri private sector and give grants. It can't uh, do some of the same things in terms of partnership development that a nonprofit can. So we spun this off as a nonprofit, working on educating people on issues. And uh, again, I won't go into detail, but this uh, last winter issued um, grants to several organizations everything from providing free transit to the University of Utah's developing an app or a little video game kind of thing so kids or all of us can explore different air quality strategies and, and compete and have a little, get points for it and, and make it kind of fun. Electric vehicle charging stations, etc. Probably seen the public awareness campaign funded with state money and we're raising money from the private sector. UCARE and Envision Utah are jointly developing that, and there's a commitment at the legislature to continue funding that effort. But at the end of the day, in order to solve this problem, each of us has to own it. We have to understand that the way we live our lives impacts air quality. Every time we turn on a light, every time we turn on our car, um, you know, every time we purchase products that are manufactured, we make a contribution to the air pollution problem. If we're going to get there, all of us need to change behaviors. And we've certainly seen that happen over time. We've seen it with littering campaigns, seatbelt campaigns. We've seen it in slow the flow in water. You know, we've had this campaign, and we've, uh, over the last seven or eight years, reduced our per capita water use by about 18 um, percent. It's a big deal. We need to do the same thing with air quality. So I'm optimistic. There are significant challenges ahead of us. We know that we've picked the low-hanging fruit. We know that the solutions of the future are only more expensive and more impactful of our daily lives. But we also recognize that air pollution is impactful of our daily lives and has real impact on the things that we care about, going back to those values that I talked about at the beginning. There's no excuse. Everybody needs to take part. We're going to get there. And the fact that we've made progress gives me hope. The fact that we have people like you that are concerned about the issue gives me hope. The fact that people are willing to go up to the legislature, make calls, stand on the steps, say this is important to us, 
gives me hope. So we're going to get there and uh, look forward to, to working with you to do that. Thanks very much. So with the caveat that anybody who asks a question is going to make me late for my son's basketball game, I'm willing to, <laughs> I am willing to take a few questions. So I've got a microphone here. If you'd like to use it, I'll bring it over to you if you've got a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of kidding. They're, they're playing American Fork. American Fork has twin towers, 610, 69. It's a tough game. Place for Brighton. Could be the end of the road. <laughs> so I tell you, I, I haven't missed a game this year, which is remarkable given what's going on at the Capitol, but um, may not have to now. Questions here? Well, I, I know I have one. Oh, over there. Great. I'm Jeff Robertson with the uh, Sun Health Sciences. We're business in Salt Lake uh, County. And um, I had a question. We're looking at ways to um, implement an idle-free program on our, uh, at our place of business. We have product that uh, ships out and uh, raw materials that come in. And uh, we've been told that drivers that uh, come to our location uh, generally will not turn off their, their vehicles, even if we ask them to. I'm wondering if there's strategies that can be employed to help change that, to help it make it easier. I mean, we've, we, we're even willing to put in facilities for drivers so that they can come inside and, and do other things. But I've, I've been told that they just won't turn their engines off. And, you know, it, it is a tough issue. Um, I'm not sure I've got a solution, but if, if you go to uh, TravelWise, it's a UDOT program, they've been working with the private sector to implement anti-idling efforts. And I mentioned uh, Utah Clean Cities. They're also working, especially in southern Utah, on anti-idling efforts, and uh, as well as up here. And I think if you got in contact with them, they'd have some thoughts. But this, again, is about changing behaviors. And you know, to me, I say, if I'm a little cold for a few minutes, big deal. Uh, I'm not exposing everybody in the car and outside to extra emissions. But uh, I think as we educate people, they'll uh, understand that more. Oh, just quickly, I don't want to stand in the way of the basketball game. No, no, I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah, ask away. I was intrigued with the, the cleaner fuels coming. I wondered, is the state planning on starting to buy California certified vehicles now so that when the clean, clean fuels get here, we can take full advantage of that? Yes, the, the new rule that came out federally requires that all vehicles around the country, beginning with the 2017 model year, meet the tier three standards, which will essentially be the California standards. So, yeah. Uh, so the issue is, what do you do between now and then? And we've been in conversations with uh, automobile dealers and said, what would it take to accelerate the process of bringing these cars in? And they say that you know, it, it's possible and that they can sell these cars. Right now, they're costing uh, roughly $300, $350 more than a Tier 2 vehicle. Uh, EPA projected that the new vehicles will cost $72 more So when they're, when they're mass produced. Um, but people today can go in, and when you buy a car, there's a little tag on there that, along with the price and along with the mileage, has a smog rating. And if you've got a car that's an 8, 9, or a 10, that's equivalent to the California standards. So part of the air quality campaign and education piece is to educate people to look for that smog rating so when they do buy a car, even before the new models come in, get that 8, 9, or 10 now. Alan, I have a question about uh, new construction on either homes and, and commercial buildings. Um, you know, historically we've moved away from leaded paint. We've moved away from asbestos-containing materials in, in buildings. And I'm looking at uh, wood burning. Is that something where that will be the lead paint and the, a, the asbestos containing material of the future where we won't have homes or businesses that uh, burn solid fuel and, or have those even available for recreational use? Do you see the state being able to weigh in on that? 
Well, it's, as I said, it's a tough issue and it's got people stirred up. I don't see in the near future anything that will say you can't build a, a wood burning stove or you can't build a wood burning fireplace in your home. Some people use them at other times of the year. But as of today, we do have restrictions on wood burning. There are certain times during an inversion where you can't burn wood. And we're saying we probably need to ratchet that down so you stop the burning earlier in the inversion so it's not building up as fast. Uh, the Division of Air Quality through the Air Quality Board is going to work with all stakeholders. They're working with the real estate industry, with the builders, with the public health community and others to develop rules that will address these things and try to find the right balance. But uh, I'll just tell you, the governor has been pretty clear. He thinks we ought to ratchet it down as much as possible, and uh, we're just going to have to bite the bullet, and uh, this is something that can make a real difference, and those are the kinds of things we need to target. So I think it'll be done with some thoughtful accommodation, but uh, we're heading toward having less wood burning. Now, recreationally, you know, you go on a camp out and have a fire, um, you know, a barbecue in the backyard. Nobody's looking at that yet, but we'll see. Um, just a quick report on uh, Tier 3 cars available in Salt Lake Valley along the Wasatch Front, in fact. Um, as of January, uh, Mark Miller and Nate Wade Subaru reported that 50% of their 2014 cars on their lot were PZEV technology as well. Um, I just bought a 2011 PZEV technology Forester from Nate Wade in January. You can buy cars probably 2009 and on you can find PCEV technology used Subarus at Nate Wade and Mark Miller, the biggest dealers. You're right. The Subarus are there for the most part. And you know, I think there's some good things happening. We started talking to the rental car agencies and say, what can you do with your fleets? Can you get those to be the California standards? And enter